Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to Congregation Yeshua's Torah Studies. And this week's Torah portion is Kai Sarah, or the life of Sarah. And if you're new to the channel, we are a Messianic congregation based in Mississauga, Ontario. Um, we are currently in two in a two weeks mandatory lockdown, so our facilities are closed, so we're not able to meet. We will resume on uh, two weeks from now, so um, I think uh, the twenty, the twenty eighth of November, we'll be back uh, praying for God's favor for our return in life fellowship. And uh, if you haven't uh, had a chance to uh, read this book, I encourage you to read this end time book talking about. The importance for us to go back to our Jewish roots because at the end of the day uh, Yeshua will return and establish his messianic kingdom back here on earth for a thousand years so for our quick summary uh, we are the Torah portion is from Genesis chapter 23 verse 1 to chapter 25 verse 18 and uh, a quick summary here is uh, we're going to look at the death of Sarah and interesting that uh, the Torah portion talks about her life but begins with her death we will look at the purchase of Abraham out of the fields of Machpelah and uh, the uh, unknown unnamed servant Eliezer's mission to find Isaac a bride and then uh, Elisha brings Rebekah back to the land of Cana Canaan, meets and marries Isaac. And then uh, we see Abraham remarries a woman named Keturah who bore him six more sons. And the Parsha ends with the death of Abraham at the age of 175 and how his two sons Isaac and Ishmael buries him at the cave of Machpelah besides his wife Sarah. And finally, a narration of the descendants, the descendants of Ishmael upon his death. So if you're ready, um, you'll notice that uh, in Genesis chapter 22, which was the Torah portions last week, that when Abraham returned unto his young men, they rose up and went together to go to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. You'll notice that... Um, there was no mention of Isaac, so you'll see here, you will not, uh, you will not see um, Isaac's name mentioned again, even during the burial of Sarah. Why is that? It is as if um, after the Ikeda or the binding of Isaac, Isaac disappears from, from the face of the earth. The same way with uh, Yeshua, remember, after the after uh, the resurrection, Yeshua returns to the, to the heavens and waits until the bride is taken uh, to heaven. When and then he returns for the second coming. So here you see here that Isaac is not mentioned until the bride is brought back is brought to him uh, in when he is in uh, the land of Israel. So an, an interesting parallel. So we're going to see a lot of these parallel patterns because God works in patterns and uh, we will see clearly the relationship or that, uh, that Isaac is the type of Messiah. Um, talking about uh, Sarah, if you think about the concept of the Virgin Miriam, Miriam was a virgin when she when she conceived Yeshua. It is an important for us to understand the importance of the virgin birth, because without the virgin birth, our sins, um, uh, Yeshua can never or will never be able to save mankind. Um, after Yeshua, um, after Yeshua was born. She had four more boys and at least two girls, as per the gospel, um, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55 to 56. Um, 
a an interesting uh, Orthodox uh, Jewish professor named Dr. Flauser from the Hebrew University. He writes that uh, that Yeshua, the, the the Messiah Yeshua, has had at least six brothers and two sisters, probably more sisters. So Miriam had more kids. She was not a perpetual virgin. However, we do learn about Miriam that she was a very righteous girl, which is why Hashem chose her. Her and Joseph both were very righteous people, righteous Jews, God-fearing, Torah-observant Jews. As a side comment here, he says that if God really wanted us today to do away with the Torah, why would he choose two good Pharis Pharisaical Jews? in order to have the Mashiach and be parents to the Mashiach. Since when do we choose people to be an example and then later tell people don't follow them? If I look at the life of Miriam, you see she's most associated with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came upon Miriam and enabled her to conceive and give birth to the child without the agency of, of human involvement. And if you look back at the life of Sarah, that's exactly what happened to Sarah. Sarah had a divine, in the, the sages call it the divine energy, but it's really, they're talking about the Holy Spirit, the Shekinah, the Shekinah glory of Hashem. Um, that is, uh, again, uh, speaking about the Ruach, Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit. We have a precedence here, a pattern. The mother of the son who was offered by a father specifically the mother of the son who was the in the image of the father offered at the altar she was intrinsically connected to the holy spirit so you see here again miriam and uh, miriam the the mother uh, of yeshua who was offered by the father the heavenly father to be a sacrifice and we see sarah who is the mother of Abraham or Isaac, who is the, the the spitting image of Abraham, so it's like uh, Abraham's image, the image of the father offered at Mount Moriah. So we see here that Sarah uh, lived 120 years old. Uh, the sages uh, write tell us that she died shortly after. Isaac was taken by Abraham to be sacrificed. Notice that Sarah died in Hebron, but Abraham lived in Beersheba. Again, no mention of Isaac. And you'll see here that um, when Sarah died in Kirat uh, Tarbah, the same is Hebron in the land of Canaan, uh, Abraham came to mourn for Sarah, Sarah and she wept for her. The Hebrew word there, um, you'll notice that the kuf is made small. Uh, why is that? The sages tell us that in the race, the Sarah's death was a result of the binding of Isaac. Isaac uh, follow, um, the binding of Isaac follow one another, indicating that she died as a result of that event. That's why we said last week that Isaac was 37 years old. He was not a kid when, when, uh, when Abraham offered him on the, on the altar. The sages commented to say that her last breath came with a proud knowledge that she had succeeded in raising a son who was willing to give his life for the service of God. That is why we know, as I said, that Isaac was 37 years old. As to regards to the calf, why is it written small? It suggests that the full extent of Abraham's weeping was kept private. His grief was infinite, but full, uh, the full measure of his pain was concealed in his heart and at the privacy of his home. So he grieved privately for Sarah. And um, Abraham um, uh, bowed himself to, before the land, uh, the people of the land, in verse uh, twelve of Genesis twenty-three, and he and he spoke to uh, and he spoke unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, "If but if you will give it, I pray thee, 
hear me, I will give money for the field. Take it to me and I will bury the dead. So, uh, but before that, uh, you see here that uh, Abraham um, was pleading with the, with the children of Heth to have to convince Ephron to sell him the cave of Machpelah. Why is the cave of Machpelah very important? The sages said that uh, it is where Adam and Eve were buried. So it was a very sought after piece of property. But Ephron here pretends to be generous, but was really overpricing the value of the cave plot. It's, he said that uh, it's like, uh, somebody's telling you, what is a, a jar of honey to me? What is $50 for a jar of honey? So he, it's, it's like he's overpricing, taking advantage because he knew that Abraham wanted that piece of property. So Abraham willingly paid and um, paid the 400 uh, silver shekels. It's equivalent to about... Um, one million dollars today and uh, the sages said that it was worth uh, at that time uh, maybe about 20 to 30 thousand dollars so he overpriced but uh, Abraham was willing to pay that price um, we see here there's a rabbinic commentation the sages said that aside from God's promise that uh, uh, the, the promise to give the land of Israel. This is one of the first things where a claim of legal right to the land of Israel is also recorded in the Bible. The land, uh, the land was purchased for a high price. And ironically today, there are three, the, the three most contested areas in the land of Israel uh, is Hebron, Shechem and Jerusalem. The world is saying that it does not belong to Israel and there is no connection to Israel to, on this land, especially those three mentioned sites. Um, but you can clearly see here that God recorded in the Bible the burial, the purchase of Hebron uh, or the purchase of the plot of Machpelah in Hebron in Genesis chapter 23 verse 16. Jerusalem by David, King David on 1 Chronicles 21 verse 25. And finally Shechem by Jacob in Genesis chapter 33 verse 19. Now when Ephron, uh, you'll notice that uh, you, you can only see this in the Hebrew Bible. When Ephron overpriced the land, uh, his name changed. Look at this. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron. Look at his name. This is the name in Ephron in Hebrew. The ayin, the pay, the resh, the, the vav, and the nun. And notice that when he overpriced the land and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver which he had named. So his name all of a sudden lost the letter vav. And uh, Ephron's name is spelled after he overcharges the, the cost of the land of Machpelah to sell to Abraham. The sages say that Ephron became a smaller man because of his greedy attitude. Notice Ephron's name is spelled with a missing vowel, um, as noted after he oversells or overprices the land that Abraham sought for a burial plot. So today this is the picture of um, where the the cave of Machpelah, they, they built a... Um, a um, monument in honor of the the um, Abraham and uh, Sarah was buried there, Jacob and Leah, and also Adam and Eve. Um, you'll notice that the servant's mission um, in in Genesis chapter twenty four. You'll notice that the servant's name is never mentioned. Uh, the, the unnamed servant's mission. Notice that the bride uh, could not be a gent Gentile woman. She needs to be a convert or the same one like Abraham who crossed over. 
uh, we, we, as we said before, that Abraham is the first Jew. He was the first convert. He converted to, uh, to become uh, a, a Jew. And uh, look at the bride. She had the same way as Abraham left his family, left his land. So shall the bride, um, in this case, Rebecca, had to leave her family, um, um, leave idolatry, um, the family of Abraham, as we can see later on in the life of Laban, they were idolaters. And uh, the bride had to abandon all of that, cross over, convert, and follow the one true living God. And, and, she, and you'll notice here that Abraham said to him, Thou shalt not take a wife from, for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. Again, she didn't want uh, the, the, the women from Canaanite, among them who dwell among us. Thou shalt go to my country, to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son. And uh, verse 5, Preadventure the women will not be willing to follow me unto this land, must I need bring my son to the land from which she come? And Abraham said to him, Beware that you shall not bring, not bring not my son there again. The Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spoke unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angels before you, and you shall take a wife unto my son. Verse 8, if the woman if shall not be willing to follow you, then you shall be clear of this oath. Only bring not my son again there. So, so what's interesting is um, uh, of all the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it's only Isaac who was not allowed to leave the land of Israel. Why is that? Because he was a sanctified offering. When you make an offering to the temple, if you are not you are not allowed to take that offering beyond the limits of the holy space they said the holy space was the vicinity within Jerusalem so you see you see here in verse 7 don't take the holy offering outside the perimeter of the holy land isaac was not allowed to go to egypt if you remember there was a famine in the land abraham went to egypt when there was a famine jacob went to egypt when there was a famine by but isaac was not allowed to go outside of Israel. Why? Because, like I said, he is the he is a holy offering. That is why, as believers, we cannot just go anywhere we want. That is that is why we cannot just eat anything we want to eat. That is why we cannot just wear anything we want to wear. Why? Because we are a holy sacrifice. We are. Uh, we call it a a a kudush cup. Of Hashem, we have been set apart. Um, we have to be used for a holy purpose. You have to carry yourself in a holy way, eat in a holy manner. Why? Because you are a holy offering. You don't want to be treated just like any old mundane thing, because you are not mundane. You are a holy, set apart, righteous tzedek. You are a scholar. Well, you say, oh, I don't feel like a righteous tzedek or a scholar. Good thing is, it's not up to us. Amen? God has made us to be his kings and priests. Amen? And a um, little bit of the bride. Why? Today, the Messiah is depicted as a universal savior, void of its Jewish connection. Instead of the bride learning the ways of the Messiah... The ways of Torah, the bride has been far removed itself from her Jewishness. It has become like the followers of a pagan Greek or Roman Messiah who was born on December 25 and resurrected on Easter Sunday. You'll notice that the travel between Nahor and Hebron was a long journey. You'll see later on that it was about approximately 400 miles. It was a long way. So, Eliezer, which uh, is, is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the unnamed sa servant, um, is taking the time to teach her, the bride, all things about the Son. In our case, the Messiah. 
Prophetically, the bride will be raptured and will be brought to Yeshua, just like Isaac or just like Rebecca had to travel uh, to go to meet Isaac. But Isaac had to travel from Beersheba to Hebron. Yeshua too will be meeting us in the air. So you can see here, if you can see here the pattern, Abraham represented by God the Father is seeking a bride for his son. Eliezer, the unnamed servant, is the Holy Spirit, and Isaac represents Yeshua. So you'll notice that uh, even today, the church has distanced itself from Yeshua's Jewish identity, falsely teaching that Yeshua came and, is, and, and established a new religion called Christianity. That is void of his Torah. The question is, did Yeshua establish or started a new religion that is totally different from the Torah of his forefathers? Uh, that is further from the truth. The question for us today, if Yeshua is both king and priest, then one of the requirements of a high priest, especially Oh, sorry, the priest, or especially the high priest, in terms of marriage, is a high priest or, or a priest cannot marry a non Jewish and a non virgin woman. The bride needs to be Jewish and needs to be a virgin. That's why um, today, um, you know, we are, um, um, we are grafted in to the nation of Israel. Israel is the bride. So as I said, uh, it was quite a distance um, between the, the journey of Rivka to meet his, his bridegroom. And during that period, um, it's a period of time for the unnamed servant, or in this case, the Holy Spirit, to teach about the Son. So did, did not Yeshua say he will, um, the Holy Spirit is the, is the Spirit of truth. He will show us all things um, about him. He will reveal to us. Now, um, in Genesis chapter 24, when uh, when Eliezer, or the unnamed servant, meets Rebecca for the first time, verse 16 records that the damsel was, was very fair to look upon, a virgin. And the Hebrew word there is Betula or Betula. And Betula um, and Alma are two words to mean the same thing, a virgin. In the prophecy of Isaiah relating to the birth of the Messiah, the prophecy says that that behold a young child or an alma uh, shall shall be with child so um, the anti-missionary is saying that uh, the, the word alma is a, is a young child it doesn't mean a virgin but you'll notice that in verse 16 um, Elijah uh, Elijah mentions um, Rebecca as a betula and later on um, in verse 20, 25, he uses the word Alma, or a young woman, or a young child, to describe Rebecca. So the word can, the word Alma and Betula can be interchanged to mean the same thing, to mean a virgin. And you'll notice that Rebecca had a servant heart. He cared for strangers who was thirsty and also for the animals. What did Yeshua say? If you want to be great in his kingdom, number one, you have to follow Torah, right? Matthew chapter 5. He that um, teaches and observes is great in his kingdom. And also, he said in John 13, you know, you, you need to be a servant. He washed the, the disciples' feet and he said to them, "Do if I, your, your leader, your Lord, did this, you should do this to one another. So 
Um, and then gifts were given. Gifts were given um, the, uh, to Rebecca uh, are symbolic um, of ties to the covenant. For example, the Hebrew word half shekel is the word Becca. Becca is a rare word because it only appears twice in the Torah. First time here um, in procure or in 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 finding a bride, uh, and uh, that word Becca is is later used when um, when the temple or the tabernacle is going is built. So every a uh, male 20 years old or older is is to uh, is to give a becca or a half shekel so um and also he said she was given two bracelets in her hands and, and 10 shekels weight of gold so here the 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 symbolism here is they said that the the Becca, are, like I said, is a rare word. You're finding the bride for the son, and later in Exodus, the building of the tabernacle, as each man had to contribute a half shekel, the bride, and then a home. So that's the sequence. You find a bride, and you build your home. The two bracelets symbolizes the two tablets of the Ten Commandments given by God at Mount Sinai. The ten shekel weights of gold is symbolic of the Ten Commandments. So Rebe Rebecca's given a nose ring they said contains precious stone emerald embedded on the nose ring very very large precious emerald the bracelet half shekel match the half shekel given by each jew at the census and used for the temple the two bracelets symbolizes the two tablets which should be which would be binding upon rebecca and her descendants and the ten shekels that are weighed collectively symbolizes the Ten Commandments. The reason why I bring this up is because many people look at the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the tablets as handcuffs, shackles that keep us bound, and we are not allowed to do what we want to do, but, it, but that is not how Jew, the Jews or Judaism view the commandments of God. We view the commandments of God as a precious golden bracelet that we wear, that we get to wear, we get to display, we get to enjoy, that we get to make us feel more beautiful. They are not handcuffs. They are golden bracelets. There's a big difference between a handcuff and a bracelet. God's Torah is not a burden. Well, Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, He said, uh, come to me, all you are laden and, and, and heavy la laden, and you shall find rest. For my burden is easy and my burden is light. It was never a Jewish concept that the Messiah will come one day to take away the Torah, to take away the law from, from the people. That is a f false teaching coming from re the replacement theology doctrine. The law and instructions of God are a source of blessings, always. And every time we obey His commandments, we not only elevate ourselves, we elevate the world, and most of all, we elevate God in our lives. That is the effect of obedience to God thus in our lives. There's a, an amazing parallel between the selection of the bride for Isaac, and Isaac is the type of Yeshua, and selecting the first king. Uh, we will discover this was discovered by using this by, by by the sages looking at the same words found in the two stories. We shall see the connection of Yeshua and the as king and as his and the selection of the bride so here the first parallel you'll see here in genesis chapter 24 24 the phrase here the daughters of the of the men of the city came out to draw water so as um eliezer was contemplating he was planning 
to find women as they draw water from the city. And look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 11. And when uh, and they went up to the ascent of the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. So again, same phrase, same word, same phrase found in the story of Rebecca and the story of Saul, the first king. And here you see here, and uh, as it came to pass before he had done speaking, talking about um, Re Re uh, Rebecca's sudden appearing, this word uh, Torem, Terem, Terem, and also before he went up to that place, again that same word Torem, uh, talking about uh, Samuel uh, meeting Saul before he goes up to that to the place to eat. And then there is that uh, Rebecca comes out. Before he had done seeing, behold, Rebecca comes out. And that word here, Vehainu, uh, Vehana. And also Samuel comes out. So again, the same word found in both stories. And finally, um, the, the, the secret. The secret, the secret uh, that Eliezer, the unnamed servant, was said said before the said before um, Laban and his father said, "I I shall not eat food with, uh, as there was food set before him to eat." He said, "I will not eat until I tell you my errand or my secret." Same way in First Samuel chapter nine, verse nineteen. Uh, Samuel asked Saul to stay with him for two days. And he said, in the morning, I will let you go and I'll tell you all that is in my heart. So again, the, the, the secret, both stories had a secret. So what is the connection between a bride and a king? Well, uh, marriage really is about the formation of a new entity. The two me's become we. In marriage, there is no he or she anymore. They create a new being. In marriage, the two lives die at the altar and are reborn to a new entity, a new beginning. So a, a, a couple, there is a potential to have children, many children, but many children does not make a nation. They need a king. So they need to form a government, a government that will uh, decide what is the best for them. So the king really pulls the nation together. So in uh, Genesis chapter 15, the prophecy of Abraham, he says here, he said that, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now towards heaven and count the stars. If you can, you are able to count them, he said. So shall they, they see be. So God promised Abraham that he will have many children. And not only did God promise him many children, he said, I'm going to give you a land. He said, and I will, great, I will make a great nation and I will bless you and make a great name and you shall be a blessing. So God promised that uh, not only will Abraham have many descendants, he'll have land, he'll have many children, but he will be a great nation. In fact, he said, that I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Genesis chapter 17. So kings, we know that Yeshua, the, the promised king savior, will come out of the, the seed of Isaac, who was being given a bride in this story, in this Torah portion. So we see the connection of Yeshua here in the prophecy because Kings will come out. Yeshua will come out uh, from this union. So we'll see here, uh, going back to the story of El of Rebecca, um, the prayer of El of the unnamed servant on how she, he, he will identify the bride that God has selected for Isaac. So we know the story of how he not only uh, gave him water, but also asked if she could uh, give water to the camels. But 
Rebecca had to say yes. You see, uh, Rebecca had to say yes. The, the brothers and the mother said, let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least 10. In fact, in their tradition, when a woman is uh, to be given in marriage, they wanted to prepare or keep the woman for 10 months at least, or a year, even a year. Then after that, she can go. And But he said to him, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire in her mouth. And they called Rebecca. And they said to her, Will you go with this man? And he said, I will go. And they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse. And Abram's servant said to the men, and they blessed Re Rebekah and said to her, thou art, our, thou art our sister, be thou mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gates of those who hate them. And Rebekah arose and her damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And servant took Rebekah and went his way. So, so you see here the importance of Rebekah following the man, following who? Following the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. Um, and you notice that there's no, if the time is if the time is come for her to be taken, there's no dilly dallying, there's no, uh, there's no delay anymore. It's uh, it's time to go, and it's time to go. So there's no, there's no room in, in anymore for for playing playing games today is serious we're living in the the last of the last days rebecca which represents the bride follows the holy spirit in the journey to meet the bride the bridegroom the messiah in verse 61 um and like i said you know it the journey was long the um and it it was a great time for um the Holy Spirit to reveal about the Son, and we, we are living in these days now where um, He's revealing to us our our Jewish identity. We need to, to get back to Torah. We need to go back to God's commandments in our lives. Why? Because it is for our good. It is for our blessing. Um, and finally, um, He meets Isaac, the bride is taken to the bridegroom. The bridegroom is waiting in Hebron. So he had to, uh, um, Isaac was in Ber, Ber Lahai Roy and he had to travel to Hebron. The same way the Messiah will meet us in the air and, uh, and we will be taken. We will, we will meet him in the air. So there's a, there's a moment of meeting. And then um, um, Isaac brings Re Rebecca, the bride, to his tent, and we will be taken um, in the tent of the Lord. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, you see there, For the Lord himself, verse 16, uh, will come down from heaven with a rousing call from one of the ruling angels and with God's shofar. Those who have died united in the Messiah will, be, will rise first and then we who are left alive will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, we will always be with the Lord. So encourage each other with this word. So um, it's important for us to understand that, you know, we, this, is, this is our preparation time. He's looking for a bride without spot or wrinkle. You know, how do we, how do we know to live righteous lives? How do we know... To live a life without spot or wrinkle. You know where we will know that? Is through his commandments, his instructions. You know, we will we will not find uh, any other source of 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 how to be the bride of the Messiah than in God's word in his Torah instructions to us. And uh, we are the waiting bride, and and, and uh, you know we need to get make ourselves ready because 
when the time comes, as, as Rivka was ready, Rivka was uh, ready to go. She, she had a servant heart. She was uh, uh, um, kind to strangers. She was willing to serve. And, um, and when the time came, she was ready to go, ready to go. She didn't have to um, delay anymore because um, her time is to come and she had to she had to convert. She had to leave behind her idolatry, idolatry, idolatrous family. She had to leave behind um, and cross over. She's an ever. She uh, she's a Hebrew, an Israel and a Jew is the the same word. She had to convert to follow the one true living God, and that's what we need to do. We need to to um, follow the one true living God his commandments his torah and uh, we need to move away from 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 our from the pagan uh religion we need to get away from from idolatry you need to get away from from things uh that would separate us from the one true living god and we'll see here that um, uh, Abraham, uh, the, uh, after the death of Sarah, marries Keturah. In the, in the book of the sages, they said that Keturah, in the, in the oral tradition, they said that Keturah uh, is actually Hagar. Hagar that had sp spiritually transformed and renamed herself Keturah. Keturah means incense. That's why what's interesting here, they said that, uh, that uh, we'll see here, but uh, you see that Abraham, the, the son of the promise is through Isaac because uh, Abraham had a son through Hagar and, uh, and Keturah had six more sons. But the, the messianic line or the line of the promise is through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob had the 12 sons and plus Dinah. So uh, in the next verse, it says here that Abraham took another wife and name was Keturah and she bore him those, the six sons. And then Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. Again, that's a that's a pattern. That's a pa that's a pattern because what did Yesh what did the father said to Yeshua? The father loves the son, and he has put everything in his hands. Look at that in Matthew chapter twenty eight. Yeshua came and talked to them and said, "All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me." So, same way that Abraham gave all to his son Isaac, so is the father giving all to his son Yeshua. But you see here, but for the sons of the concubines. That's why um, they said that. That's why this is the, the key word here, um, Keturah, um, because it technically Sarah is dead. Why is she called a concubine? Why? Because it goes back to, to uh, Hagar, because Hagar was a concubine. So Abraham ha gave gifts to the sons. And he sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he still yet lived eastward into the east country. So, so in order to avoid conflict, Abraham gives gifts to his sons through Keturah and tells them to move away further east. And uh, not that Abraham didn't love his other children, but it's just because... It was Isaac where the inheritance of the land and his descendants will, will continue. So we learn later on in Genesis chapter 25, verse 16, that finally Abraham dies at the age of 175. And uh, both Isaac and Ishmael buries him uh, together with his wife Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. Uh, and then we learn that Ishmael dies as well. And uh, what's interesting about the death of Ishmael is 
the Hebrew word debt appears twice, but in different form. Because in English, you can see that he, he expired and died. The, the Hebrew word die there is the Hebrew word mot, 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 died. And then in verse 18, it seems like Ishmael dies again and he dwelt from Havila, Sur, that is before Egypt, as he goes toward Assyria and he died in the presence of his brethren. So the Hebrew word death there is the Hebrew word nafal. Nafal, nafal means to fall. So what when, when what the sages were saying is uh, the second word meaning fall alludes to the fact that in the last days the children of Ishmael will gather against the Jewish people and they will fall when the Messiah will come as Isaac is mentioned in verse 19 following. So this ends the Torah portion and then the next Torah portion is called Tudot. And in verse 19, here is the big history of Isaac, Isaac, Abraham's son. So uh, the fact that Isaac is mentioned next indicates that he will be, the children of Israel will be victorious against the attacks of the children of the descendants of Ishmael. So um, with that, um, Sarah is really a model of what a Kahil woman is. And as a result of her inner righteousness, her outer beauty never diminished. Can you imagine, even at the age of 90, she was being sought after by kings. Why? What is her beauty secret? Her inner righteousness. So as the father uh, seeks for a bride for his son Isaac, so is our heavenly father is seeking and training the bride for his son Yeshua. The question for you and I, have we said yes to him today? So Father, as I end today's session relating to the life of Sarah, I lift up my brothers and sisters today that are able to participate and, and listen to your teaching. May you bless each one. May you keep everyone under your wings, under your protection, as the world scours in fear and trembling about this COVID-19. Father, we thank you that we you are raising an army, an army of believers in Yeshua, who will not scour, who will not be moved by the things that they hear, the things that they see, but they will be moved by your word. Your word says that by his stripes we are healed. Your word says that no weapon for or against us shall prosper. Shall prosper. Your word says that no, we shall not fear of the terror by day or the terror by night, but pestilence that, that break in at noonday. Father, we thank you for your hedge of protection for all your people. We speak healing. We speak your protection. We, we speak your divine provision. We pray for families that were impacted by so many storms that were raging all over the world or any calamity that's happened to your children. Father, watch over your people. Have mercy on the people of the world, Father. We have sinned and come short of your glory. Pray that you will use each and every one of us to be the spark, to be the light, to be the ones that will elevate not only ourselves, but the world around us, our communities. We pray for, as, uh, as believers in Yeshua, we have a dual role. Uh, we are citizens of this world, yes, and our role is to intercede for the nations. And also our role as uh, children of the Most High. We are in the world, but not of the world. So we. We are destined to be alone because if our obedience or following the Torah makes us isolated, makes us separated from the world, then so be it, Father. But we pray that you will, you will bless your, your people as we serve you with all our heart. We pray that our lives will reflect the love and joy and peace that you, you bring to our lives. 
as we bring it to the lives of others. We ask in Yeshua, our Messiah. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So if you're, again, uh, new to the channel, if you're in, you've been enjoying this teaching, we uh, urge you to, uh, to like our video. And if you have any comments, any questions, uh, please uh, post your questions or send us an email. We we uh, we will promise to um, answer your questions. If we if we don't know the answer, we will research it. Uh, but I challenge you guys to uh, seek the truth because the the truth the truth shall set us free. So the Lord told Moses to tell to tell Aaron to bless the people, and so are you blessed and marked today. Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord let his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Peace in the name of Yeshua, our Shah Shalom, our Prince of Peace. Amen. God bless you and hope to see you again next time. Shabbat Shalom to everyone.